and even then only when it's not misty or foggy. Early last century, people started experimenting with electric telegraphs. And I have a beautiful example on my right, which dates from about 1839. Let me tell you about the history of the electric telegraph. It all derives really from a very early observation by Ersted. In 1819, he showed that if you had a current in a wire, it deflected a compass needle. So he was able to show a relationship between current and magnetism. A Russian diplomat, Baron Schilling, thought that well, this might be a good idea to send information. But he didn't take that idea very far. But an Englishman called Cook thought, well, this really would be a good idea. I can make it commercial. He tried, but he wasn't a scientist. But he knew that Wheatstone was interested in this kind of problem. And the two of them formed a partnership. And in 1837, they were given a patent, the very first patent for the electric telegraph. Wheatstone had come about this type of research in a very roundabout way. His parents were musicians, and he'd been interested in the velocity of sound. Now he became interested in the velocity of this new electric fluid called electricity. And in the basement of where he did his research, he had a coil of wire four miles long, can you imagine that, where he sent a message along and tried to time how long it took to reach the other end. And in this way, he was able to estimate crudely that the velocity was roughly equal to the velocity of light. And so, as I said, Cook and Wheatstone formed a partnership, and they produced telegraphs of this kind. We call this a five-needle telegraph. You can see here very clearly five distinct needles. They're wired up, and so if I press two of these keys, you see these needles deflecting. It's easier for me to explain how this five-needle telegraph works using the next sequence of slides. Here's the diamond of the telegraph, and here are the five needles. Now, let's suppose it's the letter F that we want to transmit. Well, these two needles will move. You see they're pointing towards that letter F. If it's the letter A that we want to transmit, it's these two needles that move. And there they are, they're pointing to the letter A. And in this way, we can build up a word. R, A, D, A, Y, Faraday. I have in front of me here a couple of so-called ABC telegraphs from that period made by Wheatstone's company. And I'd like a couple of assistants to help me. Would you like to come and help? What I'd like you to do is to stand down there by the receiver end. You just stand there, and I'll tell you exactly what to do. And let's see if I can have a bond. Would you like to come and help me? Can you squeeze past everybody else? Now, what I want you to do is to help me transmit a message to that young gentleman over there. I'm not going to ask you your name for a very good reason, but we'll ask you what your name is. Hello, Charles. Now, let's pretend you're in a totally different room from us, and this young lady is going to send you a message. And she's going to send you her name. And I want you to write down, as each letter moves there, just what her name is, and let's check if the whole thing is working. Now, what I want you to do is, if this is the first letter of your name, you push that, and then you must turn that handle very quickly. So why don't you do that? If you press the first letter of your name, and then you turn it very quickly. That's it. Good. That's the first letter. Now to the next one. Good. That's your name? Great. Now let's see what your name is. Her name is Maya. That's right, I think. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your help. <laughs> that sort of transmission of information is very public. And so one of the first things that Wheatstone did was to invent a cryptograph. And I have an example here of that cryptograph. 
where now if you wanted, say, to transmit the letter K, what you'd actually do is to send the letter W. So there was a code built into here. The five-needle telegraph that I've just described to you here was used for the first time along the railway line between Paddington and West Drayton. And this is a section of wood here, which you can see contains five wires. And this section of wood was sent was all the way along the line from Paddington to West Drayton, carrying the five telegraph wires that actually stimulated these needles on the telegraph. The telegraph became very well known in 1844 because when the second son was born to Queen Victoria, within minutes of the birth, the information arrived in London. The Times published it just, it was just in time for that evening's publication. And the whole country came to realize just how important the telegraph could be. Another important invention at that time was made by a Welshman called David Hughes. What he worked out was an automatic printing telegraph. So instead of somebody having to wait at the other end, like Charles did just then, you could actually have a printed um, information waiting for you when you got back to your telegraph. Wheatstone found fame and fortune from his invention. He was charging four miles, sorry, four pounds per mile per year for his telegraph. And his company was nationalized in 1869, so he became a very rich man. He also obtained a knighthood. In this royal institution here, about that time, Sir William Priest, who was the chief engineer at the post office, said during a discourse, I have not the slightest hesitation in saying that our telegraphic apparatus, thanks to Wheatstone, is at the head of the world. There is not a town in the United Kingdom possessing a daily newspaper that is not in direct communication with London for news purposes. And by this means, every man receives at his breakfast table the latest item of news. He added, my own impression is that the time is not too far distant when even America will take advantage of the inventions we are now using. But America was doing very nicely, thank you, because independently of Wheatstone and Cook, two Americans, Morse and Vale, had invented their own telegraph. And that required a slightly different principle. And you're all familiar now with Morse code. Where you can send a binary signal. It's a bit like the American smoke signals. It's a binary signal that you can send. Morse was the first to appreciate that you needed some sort of standard code. And what he worked out was a system where the most commonly used letters, like the vowels, E, for example, is a simple dot. Two dots is the letter I. He was able to divide, derive a standard code which was even used in the Second World War to great effect. What I have in front of me here is a slightly advanced version of Morse's equipment, where instead of the dot dash, dot dash, you can see here a piece of metal which has grooves in. Where there's a sharp groove, that corresponds to a dot. And when it levels out, that's a dash. And so by moving this along, you can very, very quickly transcribe the information. So this is an advance on the simple Morse transmitter. Morse was given permission to set up his telegraph between Washington and Baltimore. And so America was very soon linked with telegraphy. Because of improvements in insulation of cables, it was then possible to lay cables in the sea. And London and Paris was linked by telegraph in 1852. And more importantly, Wales and Ireland were linked in that same year. England and India were linked in 1864. And two years later, the really big one, England was linked to the United States. 
and the ship that was used to carry out that very difficult task was Brunel's steamship, the important ship called the Great Eastern. So what I've described to you is really the birth of electrical engineering. The profession, the industry of electrical engineering started with the electrical telegraph. Because these pioneers had shown that you could transmit intelligence at the speed of light right across the surface of the earth. But despite that speed of communication, the electric telegraph had its drawbacks. And that was because of the human interface. You had to give a message to somebody, he would code it, send it one letter at a time, and then decode it. So it really wasn't that swift a means of communication. But about the same time, the second dramatic change in telecommunications last century started. And this was the invention of the telephone. It's a bit like the telegraph, really, in that the real pioneers, those who did the basic science on the telephone, are not really well recognized now. But there was a German called Philip Rice, who, long before the telephone was officially invented, sent musical melodies along a wire. But the person who is credited with inventing the telephone is Alexander Graham Bell. He was a Scotsman at the age of 23. He left, he emigrated to Canada. And on St. Valentine's Day, 1876, he filed the patent for his telephone. But he was incredibly lucky because that very same day, an orphan boy called Elisha Gray also filed the patent for the telephone. What people didn't know at that time was that Bell had not, in fact, transmitted human speech on the telephone. That occurred one month later, using Elisha Gray's transmitter. So Bell, in my opinion, was rather fortunate to be called the inventor of the telephone. Bell designed various kinds of telephone, and his first was what we now call the butter stamp telephone. That's because, in terms of its shape, it's very similar to the wooden instruments they used to use to make imprints in pats of butter. But this was the type of instrument they used. You could speak into it, and you could also listen as well. And if you were wealthy, you had two of them. So you could both speak and listen at the same time. Alongside me here, I've got an upmarket version of the butter stamp telephone. Two years after his invention, in fact, during his honeymoon, Bell visited England. And he had an audience with Queen Victoria. And this was in Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. And this was the telephone that he presented to her. This is a rather ornate telephone, and it's been loaned to me by the Science Museum. The butter stamp instrument is rather more sophisticated than this one. You see it hangs on a hook, which was a feature of these butter stamp telephones. And the origin of expressions such as, I'm hanging up now, or off the hook, putting the phone off the hook, comes from that period. So those are early examples of Bell telephones. The principle on which they're based was that discovered by Faraday in this royal institution here in 1821. What Faraday discovered was that if you have a coil and place it in a magnetic field. So here are the poles of the magnet I have here. And if you move that current in the coil, you induce a current. Now, perhaps somebody would like to help me with this. Would you like to come and help me with this demonstration? What I'd like you to do is to rotate this wheel. And what you'll be doing, you see, is that this wire you'll be moving in this magnetic field, and what that does is to produce a current. And what we should find, if all goes well, is that that bulb will light up. So why not turn it round as fast as you can? There we are. Can you see the light coming on? Excellent. Thank you very much for your help. <laughs> 
What Bell had done was to work out his receive and transmitter this way. He said, let's take some vibrating membrane. And in his case, he just took parchment paper. He said, well, sound signals will vibrate the membrane. If we now attach a piece of iron, and he did that using a clock spring, that piece of iron will oscillate as the sound hits the membrane. And if we position that piece of iron close to the poles of a magnet, we can induce a current. So there'll be an alternating current produced, which will be in harmony with the sound signals. And that was the basis of both his receiver and his transmitter, the earpiece and the mouthpiece. Now, that invention is rather good for a receiver, and even modern telephones use that principle. But as a transmitter, it really isn't any good at all. And the person that is responsible for introducing the transmitter or microphone that we have these days is Edison. You've heard about Edison before in our first lecture. We had him inventing the light bulb, and in the third lecture, the phonograph. Well, here he was now with a major invention. As you know, he'd been working on carbon filaments for light bulbs. What he discovered during the course of these measurements was that if you have some carbon, and if you put pressure on it, its resistance changes. And I'll try and demonstrate that to you now. Here I've shown the resistance of this carbon. I'm now going to turn the needle and put pressure on it, and you can see the resistance decreasing. This was the effect that Edison noticed, and he based his microphone on it. The person who actually fully explained what was going on was David Hughes, the Welshman who'd invented the automatic printing telegraph. And what David Hughes had said was that it's not compressing the, the carbon that matters, it's the interfaces between tiny pieces of carbon that are there. And he said, you'll get a much, much larger signal if you use carbon particles or carbon granules rather than a solid piece of carbon. Now, I have a very simple demonstration here, and I'd like somebody to help me. Would you like to come and help? What's your name? Emma. Emma. Now, what I've got here, Emma, if you just come around here, I've got lots of carbon particles. And just to show that they really are fine particles, I'd like to pour those into that glass. See, it's very, very fine carbon. That's what I've got there. And before the program, what I did was to put the carbon particles into this microphone here. So that was using Hughes's principle. Now, what I want to do now, it seems to be working, doesn't it? Would you like to shout into this Hughes microphone? And shout your name, that would be the best, wouldn't it? Emma Shanks. And do you get closer? Emma Shanks. Very good, you see? It really does work, doesn't it? That works as a microphone. Thank you very much for helping, Emma. And so modern-day microphones are based on Edison's microphone and on Bell's receiver. And not surprisingly, these two gifted inventors put their heads together and they formed a joint venture. And I have here a telephone from that period made by the Edison Telephone Company. And as you can see, you can speak in here and you can listen here. So that's a very, very old telephone dating from about 1880. It'll surprise some of you to know that George Bernard Shaw once was employed by the Edison Telephone Company. In one of his works, George Bernard Shaw says, you must not suppose because I am a man of letters that I never tried to earn an honest living. Obviously, being a playwright must have been dishonest. I began trying to commit that sin against my nature when I was 15 and persevered until I was 23. My last attempt was in 1879, when a company was formed in London to exploit an ingenious invention by Mr. Thomas Alva Edison. A much too ingenious invention, as it proved. It bellowed your most private communications all over the house, instead of whispering them with some sort of discretion. <laughs> 
So the telephone was the second of these important breakthroughs in telecommunications last century. The third one was telegraphy without wires or radio. Radio waves had been predicted theoretically by Maxwell many years previously. But the first practical demonstration of radio waves, believe it or not, was by David Hughes, that same Welshman who invented the automatic printing telegraph and the microphonic effect that I've just described in carbon granules. What he did was to send signals along about 500 yards of Great Portland Street near, near Regent's Park in 1879. The person who's given the credit for the invention is Heinrich Hertz. In 1888, exactly one century ago, using equipment like this, and this is a replica provided for me by the University of Kent, he was able to transmit radio waves. The principle here is that you have a spark generator. This generator spark here, and that connects the two parts of this dipole. And when that happens, you get charges of opposite sign on these pieces of zinc at opposite ends here. And they oscillate. And using dimensions of about this size, you send off a frequency of about 50 megahertz. So we can honestly say that Hertz was a bright spark. <laughs> In order to pick up the signal, Hertz required an aerial, a bit like this. So that if you have an aerial of the right dimensions, you could cause oscillations by the free electrons in here corresponding to the frequency of the transmitter. A few years later, and in fact the announcement was made in this Royal Institution here, a person called Oliver Lodge described tuned circuits where you could modify aerials to tune in to particular frequencies. The person we regard as the inventor of genuine commercial radio is Marconi. And in 1901, he sent signals all the way across to America. The Russians disagree with us. May the 7th in Russia is called Radio Day. And that's because they believe that a Russian called Popov invented the radio. The BBC as I mentioned in a previous lecture, started in 1922. And this meant that modern microphones had to be invented rather better than the ones in a normal telephone. And I have a couple of beautiful examples here of silver telephones, silver microphones, excuse me, made by the MI company for royalty. Every member of the royal family had their own microphone which is very, very heavy. It's made of solid silver. This was made for Queen Mary. And the one alongside me here is the one that was reserved for King George V. And on here is inscribed all the various special occasions when he actually used this special microphone. So I've described to you now the three basic telecommunication inventories, inventions excuse me, of last century. Hughes, this famous Welshman, figured in all of them. And he is commemorated, in fact, by the Royal Society of London. A special award is given each year, a very prestigious award, for a person who's done novel work in communications. The consumer had a lot to say, obviously, in inventions like the telegraph, and especially the telephone. When you produce something new like a telephone, there's certain resistance to change initially. Charles Priest, who I've quoted earlier, who thought wonderful things of the telegraph, didn't think the telephone was necessary. He said, we have enough messenger boys in this country to send messages around. We don't need the telephone. But as gradual acceptance comes, so technical improvements are made and that then speeds up the acceptance and you get a rapid acceptance then. Behind me here, I have some beautiful examples of telephones which again have come from the Science Museum. <laughs>
And these illustrate really how telephones have changed over the years. This type of telephone here was the very first sold by the post office. The receiver was rather heavy, and it's in this box here, and therefore it was wall mounted. And so you spoke in here, and you had to listen through these tubes. This one here was made by Ericsson in Sweden, a company that is still in existence. And this was the first telephone to couple together the earpiece and the mouthpiece. Really very nice phone that dates from 1893. This telephone is an interesting beast. It dates from 1905 and is the Strouger telephone, or sometimes called the pot belly phone for obvious reasons. This was a very, very good invention because, as you can see, it has numerals on here. Strouger was an American undertaker, and he was very, very fed up because telephone operators were sending all the trade to his competitors when people telephoned in. And he invented an automatic switching system which formed the basis of automatic telephone exchanges. And so it's from this period that you see dials like this on the telephone. This example here, you can call the first mobile telephone. It was attached to the trams built in 1901 that went up the Great Orme near Llandidno in North Wales. This is a very, very popular telephone shape. This is the candlestick phone, which was used in the late 20s and the 30s. These days, of course, we have push-button phones like this. But you can now purchase push-button phones virtually the same shape as this old candlestick phone. I have here a very, very interesting little book. It's a very thin book. It's the telephone directory for London for 1880. It's worth looking at the first page because it acknowledges the fact that it uses patents by Bell, Edison, and Crossley. Do you know there isn't a single Roberts in this telephone directory? There's only one Jones, and so there are four Smiths. Most of the companies involved are railway companies because the telegraph obviously started along railways and they quickly cottoned on to the use of the telephone as well. Another interesting feature is that the phone numbers are listed numerically. So we have number one, two, three, four, all the way down. The very first number is Harvey Brand and Company. They had the number one in the telephone. This interesting one here dates from 1899. And it's the telephone directory for all of Britain and all of Ireland, all in that book there. The London section is just that thick. Let me highlight for you one page in here. I'll make a town in Lancashire famous now, Blackburn. The good side is that I'll make you famous. The bad side is that I'll mention the top and the beach in the cup this year. Blackburn has five pages in this telephone directory from 1899. In 1988, not only does it have its own telephone directory for the Blackburn area, but in addition, it has its own yellow pages. So things have really moved on dramatically. In the UK now, there are 35 million telephones. And 82% of the households in Britain have a telephone. But of course, it's taken 100 years, more or less, to get us to this stage. Where are we going?